friend. Amen. Amen. May the words that are heard be thine and not mine. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Did you know that Kevin Costner was one of my favorite actors? Now, not the water world Kevin Costner, but definitely the Field of Dreams one. Or Dances with Wolves. Yes, absolutely, Dances with Wolves. For those of you who haven't seen it or maybe not seen it in a while, the, the film is spectacular. The casting setting, musical scores, and screenplay are wonderful. Costner plays a Union soldier dismayed by his plight in life who finds himself assigned to an Indian Territory outpost, primitive and way out in the middle of, the, of nowhere in the wilderness. It is there with the wolves and the buffalo and the Indians that he finds himself. He truly comes into his own. In time, he earns the trust of the Sioux Indians of the area and is welcomed into their community. A critical component of his becoming and their accepting of him occurs when a rival tribe attacks the Sioux village tactically now while the majority of its war warriors were out hunting, you know, to provide food for the winter. Despite being outnumbered and outmanned, the Sioux win the day because of Dunbar. Now, that's, that's Costner's character because of his intervention. He had stockpiled some rifles at his outpost, which proved to shift the tables into the Sioux's favor. Without them, the village would have been sacked. It would have been destroyed. The women and children either killed or taken captive and their winter surplus stolen. The disaster abated. Dunbar self-actualizes. He becomes Sue. A background monologue in the battle's aftermath measures it so exactly. This is Costner. It was hard to know how to feel, he said. I had never been in a battle like this one before. This had not been a fight for territory or riches or to make men free. The battle had no ego. It had been fought to preserve the food stores that would see us through the winter to protect the lives of women and children and loved ones just a few feet away. I felt a pride that I had never felt before. I had never really known who John Dunbar was, perhaps because the name itself had no meaning. But as I heard my Sioux name being called over and over again, I knew for the first time who I really was. Coming into your own rite of passage, growing up, we use these expressions to describe a maturation process that occurs in us all. Some arrive at this point at an early age, while others kind of seems like the jury is still out. This morning, Jeremiah frightfully objects to his prophetic calling on the grounds that he is only a boy. In Corinthians, Paul acknowledges that when he was a child, he could not grasp more complex ideas. And then we have Jesus today in our gospel. It was his coming out party in Nazareth, the latest to be announced at the debutante ball. But as you realize, as the problem occurred, we read last week that it didn't go so well. Wouldn't you agree that timing is important? Some would say that it's everything. You have to be dealt the right cards at the right time. The weather has to be just right for the big picnic or the pig roast. The stars have to align and the balls bounce your way. You get the point. 
It's why we plant crops when we do or why we invest as we do or sell when we do or travel as we do or just stay at home sometimes. It's timing. This was Jesus' time. Modern scholarship holds that even Jesus had to grow into his understanding of what Christ was. His humanity would, su would suggest so, yet he was also divine. His calling was to be more than just a Jeremiah-like prophet. He was called to be the fulfillment of prophecy, more than just a reader of scrolls of Torah he was to be the completion of the law. So I think today we can at least derive two points from this epiphany. First, becoming who you are to be and understanding your calling as God would have you be, they are very difficult. Jeremiah, like most prophets, ran away from his call this guy avoided seminary for 20 years. Moses was reluctant at the burning bush. And we all know about Jonah running into a big fish with an even bigger appetite. Even Christ in Gethsemane preferred that the cup pass by him. This is not a popularity contest. It's no walk in the park. In fact, we are guaranteed that it will be hard and others may respond harshly. We are called to it nonetheless. It is safe to assume that if your Christian walk is easy, you probably haven't matured into it yet. It reminds me of Rudyard Kipling's poem, If. If you can keep your head when all about you are losing their heads and blaming it on you. If you can trust yourself when all doubt you, but make allowances for their doubting too. If you can wait and not be tired by waiting, or being lied about, don't deal in lies. Or being hated, don't give way to hating. And yet don't look too good or talk too wise. If you can dream and not make dreams your master, if you can think and not make thoughts your aim, if you can meet with triumph and disaster and treat those two imposters just the same, if you can bear the truth that is spoken twisted by knaves to make a trap for a fool, or watch, out the, or watch the things you gave your life to broken and stoop, to rebuild them again with worn out tools. If you can make one heap of all your winnings and risk it on one turn of risk and toss and lose and start again at your beginnings and never breathe a word about the loss. If you can force your heart and nerve and sinew to serve your turn long after they are gone and so hold on when there is nothing in you except the will which says, hold on. If you can talk with crowds and keep your virtue, or walk with kings nor lose the common touch, if neither foes nor loving friends can hurt you, if all men count with you but none too much, if you can feel the unforgiving minute with 60 seconds worth of distance run, then yours is the earth and all that is in it. And which is more, you will be a man, my son. Sounds like God admonishing Jeremiah today. Our second point is simply that love frames it. It is difficult, but love is there. The promise of our calling is love. Each one of us receives ours at conversion. conversion as we read last week in 1 Corinthians 12. But the next chapter, chapter 13, the love chapter, is the one that tells us how we will actually make it work. It requires love. 
And not just any garden variety of love, but God's unique brand, agapao, agape, self-sacrificing to the greatest extent, our very all kind of love. Jeremiah was promised that God would be with him. The metaphor of body in Corinthians means that we are not only promised to have God with us in the form of Christ, but that we are actually Christ's body, one, together. The benefit, if you will, is not just eternal life insurance. The benefit is grace and peace right here, right now. It becomes a we thing. We can do this. That is why we all gather right up here in the next few moments to be nourished so we can have the strength to do it. So come. Come to the table. Come and be nourished. Come and be loved. Come. Um.